All right, let's get started with our final part for our video lecture for chapter 23, dealing with Japan. So we've seen how the Ottoman Empire has failed to modernize and industrialize uh, to any successful um, level, uh, which leads to their decline. We saw how Russia does industrialize, but uh, the benefits of that industrialization aren't widespread, and therefore their decline is coming very soon. Um, you know, in the tw at the beginning of the 20th century, we saw how China refuses, due to its uh, confusion-centered thinking, refuses to modernize. Uh, and that's going to spell the doom for the Qing dynasty at the beginning of the 20th century. And lastly, we see Japan. And Japan is going to be the exception to the rule. And it's kind of strange how Japan um, becomes the exception because if you look at all these other countries in Asia during this time and their interaction with the West, Japan was literally the most isolated one of them all. Yet they're going to be the ones who will adapt Western uh, ideas and modernization and industrialization the best to the highest, most successful amount. Now, if you remember, where last time we left off Japan, Japan was being ruled by a shogun, right? The Tokugawa shogunate. And they had isolated themselves from the rest of the world, restricting trade and access to the islands only through the port of Nagasaki. And in fact, only the Dutch and the Chinese were literally allowed to come in and trade um, under very tight restrictions. But by the 1850s or so, an American ship captain, a naval officer named Matthew Perry, right? he's sometimes given the title of Commodore Perry, uh, he comes in with a steamboat with a gunboat, the same type of gunboats that the British had used to, you know, to defeat China in the Opium War. And uh, the Americans show up to Japan's border, to Tokyo Bay, um, you know, to the Bay of the capital Tokyo, and Perry comes in under orders of the president, the U.S. president, and he says that Japan needs to open up their borders. Japan needs to trade because that is the modern thing to do. Japan needs to stop being isolated. Japan needs to be part of the rest of the world. And um, so this big kind of like debate breaks out in uh, the capital. Should they open up their borders or should they not? And essentially the shogun is going to decide that it's probably best to do so. And the shogun is probably basing his decision on the fact that the British and other European powers, other Western powers, uh, have completely dominated China. And remember, for hundreds, if not over the last 2,000 years, China was the world's most powerful and richest country and Japan's closest trade ally. So if Japan sees that the Europeans um, have conquered China, Right, the biggest, baddest country out there, what can they do to Japan? Right? Japan is going to be colonized. So the shogunate decides that they are going to um, that they are going to accept these demands from the American government. So they open up their borders. The problem is that by doing so, uh, by giving in to the demands of these foreign forces, it was viewed as a sign of weakness. So many daimyos who have been uh, had had their power restricted under the shogunate view that they can uh, rebel. Right? They see this weakening, this opportunity to rebel, and they rebel against the shogunate, and they rally behind the emperor. Now, remember how the emperor of China, I mean of Japan, was always more of a symbolic religious leader, right? And now they're going to, these different daimyos who want to you know, increase their wealth and power, they're going to support the emperor and say that the emperor should be in charge because the emperor is the true leader of Japan. After all, the shogun rules on the behalf of the emperor. So the shogun's power is eliminated 
and in its place uh, we see the rise of an emperor. But the emperor, in reality, he's not really in charge, right? These different lords are going, these daimyos are going to kind of like unite, creating, creating an oligarchy. Remember oligarchy, right? The first oligarchy were the Spartans, right? Were different noble heads of families kind of like ruled together. Um, and that's what we're going to see here in Japan, the different major families are going to have pretty much concentrated all the power and wealth, uh, and they're going to be running things from now on. But of course, they're going to be running things not for themselves. They're going to be running this on behalf of the emperor. And the emperor that comes to, that rises to prominence, um, is this, uh, his, he takes on the title of Meiji. So he becomes known as the Meiji Emperor. And the Meiji Emperor, again, becomes the head of the government, but in reality, his powers is more like a constitutional monarchy. Uh, in fact, they, the Japanese, you know, they send ambassadors to Europe and to the United States to learn about how to make a constitution, how to create a government, how to have checks and balances. They establish a legislative body called the Diet of Japan, and this allows some representation for Japanese men. Uh, Japanese women won't get, won't get the right to vote until the 20th century. Um, and all of these reforms, all of these changes, all of these improvements are very drastic and sudden. Right? They weren't slow and gradual. Uh, so within like a period of 20, 30 years, uh, Japan essentially modernizes and industrializes. It's literally the fastest country to do so because the whole country is kind of like pushed into this under the leadership of the Meiji Emperor and the oligarchy rulers, uh, the families that supported him um, behind the scenes. So this era in Japanese history is known as the Meiji Restoration. Right here we see the first Meiji Emperor uh, and if you notice the paintings that we see here, like how they're dressed, right? They're not wearing the traditional kimonos. They're not wearing the traditional Japanese garments. They're wearing Western style, you know, clothing. And this tells us the uh, immense level of Westernization that the Japanese are going to adopt uh, in order to appear more advanced to the, you know, to the outside world. So Japan is going to undergo this massive program of industrialization. And similar to how, in, similar to Russia in this case, how in Russia and Japan we're going to see that the government is going to be the driving force of industrialization. Now this is different than say like Britain or the United States where it's going to be entrepreneurs and inventors and business people and merchants who are going to drive the Industrial Revolution. And the government is going to, you know, have that lives fair capitalism with their hands off. Here we have the opposite. The government's hand is on everything. And the government is going to be controlling many of the industries, especially in the industry, any industries dealing with war. So like making bombs and bullets and rifles, uh, anything that deals with warfare is going to be directly under the control of the government. Um, but other industries are going to be ruled by Zaibatsu. And Zaibatsu are basically those oligarchic families that rule, um, that have a lot of power in Japan. So we see that the government, that, you know, the heads, like the, the, like the heads of the corporations, right? Because Zaibatsu are basically like corporations. Um, they're going to be led by people, by, you know, uh, by these business people, and those same very business people are also going to be part of the government. So we see kind of like a partnership, a teamwork between the elites of the political world and the elites of the economic world, and they're going to combine together to industrialize. Um, now, some of the kind of like positive effects of this is that we see education becomes widespread, and we, see, of course, we saw this in Europe and in the United States, uh, and. On top of that, what, uh, what makes Japan unique is that they're also going to educate the girls. Right? So women are going to receive education as well. Uh, so industrialization in Japan is going to be sponsored by the government. right? And that's going to drive it. So everyone's kind of behind it. Some samurai might not be behind it because 
uh, their, their authority, their status, their place in society is now diminished. And in fact, they're going to rebel against the Meiji Emperor. Um, but for the most part, everyone in society was on board. So like I said, the samurai and the daimyos, they're going to rebel because they're going to lose their special privileges. These people were nobles, right, aristocrats. They had tax exemption, kind of like how the first and second estate of France, right, the clergy and the nobility had uh, tax exemption in France before the French Revolution. Um, same thing here in Japan. And these, you know, nobles are going to rise up against the Meiji Emperor, and they're going to fail. Now, we also see working class people are going to protest. Now, one of the reasons they protest is because, of course, they're working in factories, and those are horrible working conditions, as we've seen in any industrial country. Um, but those type, of, um, um, those type of rebellions, they tend to not be successful, right? Because the governments and the businesses and the corporations and the factories they're working together, so they're going to unite to keep down these you know, poor people from rebelling or from demanding too much rights or too much pay or too much anything. We also see that peasants who remain as agricultural workers, they're going to suffer and they're going to rebel because they're going to be taxed immensely. They're going to have to give up so much of their land that they're going to become uh, you know, landless peasants, right? just kind of working the fields that don't belong to them. Uh, the... So we, we are, not everyone in Japan is going to be happy with all this modernization, industrialization stuff. Uh, of course, the upper class, right, the Zaibatsu, they're going to be happy because they're going to benefit the most out of this. Uh, but for the most part, it's going to be positive. Now, the reason it's so positive, generally speaking, is because Japan becomes a power country, a major industrialized power which means uh, they're more or less on equal footing with the Western world. Therefore, they're not going to be at an economic disadvantage as, say, the Ottoman Empire. They're not going to be conquered like Africa and India would be conquered, which we'll talk about imperialism in the next chapter. And they're not going to be under those spheres of influence and have their territories chopped up like China was. So Japan, by modernizing, by industrializing, is going to put itself on an equal status with the West, with Europe, with the United States. And to prove this, to prove it to the world, China is going to enter these two wars. The first one is against China, and that is known as the Sino-Japanese War. And the other one is going to be the Russo-Japanese War against Russia. And in both of these wars, everyone expected China and Russia to win. Right, China because it's so big and bad and has such a large population and military, and Russia because it was a modern country, uh, an industrial country. And yet Japan wins twice. And again, this proves that the military might and the industrial power of Japan wasn't anything to kind of brush aside with. So Japan becomes this modern country. Japan becomes this powerful country. And like other, like any other industrial power, Japan is going to begin a process of imperialism. They're going to start conquering neighboring territories. So when they fight these wars against China and Russia, it isn't just to show off, but it also is to gain territory. And we know why they want to gain territory. Just like any other Western modernized country, they want to gain territory to gain access to cheap natural resources, right? the type of raw materials you need to fuel your industrial revolution. So the the Meiji era, the Meiji restoration of Japan is going to lead to its next phase in history, uh, which is going to be the Japanese Empire. And we're going to see this empire begin in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and it's going to expand all into World War II, where they're going to conquer a big part of the Pacific uh, world and Oceania and Southeast Asia, and of course, China. All right, so that is it for the Empire of Japan. We'll talk more about their steps towards imperialism when we look at imperialism around the world in our next chapter. Thanks for listening and watching and learning and all that other good stuff. See you next time.